Well, I think we'll get started for the evening. Welcome everyone to the Rosenbags virtual in uh, conversation with you. series. Welcome everyone to the There we go, a little bit of an echo. Um, <laughs> welcome everyone to the Rosenbach's virtual in conversation series. Today we're bringing you Ulrich Baer, author of My Own Dear Darling Boy, The Letters of Oscar Wilde to Lord Alfred Douglas. I am Edward G. Pettit of the Rosenbach, and welcome to you, Ulrich. And you are still muted. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you so much for hosting me for the second time at the Rosenbach. So I'm really excited to be here to talk about something in your amazing collection, which is some of the wild materials. Excellent, thank you. And thank you to all of you who are attending tonight. We bring this program to you for free. So if you'd like to help support the Rosenbach, either by donation or by becoming a member, you can do so by visiting our website. I'll put some links in the chat and in the comments on Facebook. We're also streaming live on Facebook right now. Your support helps us care for our collections and helps us bring more programs like this one to you. Our guest tonight, Ulrich Baer, is university professor at New York University, where he teaches literature and photography and directs the Center for the Humanities. He's been awarded Guggenheim, Getty, Dodd, and Humboldt fellowships in recognition of his work. He has published on poetry, photography, and cultural politics. In 2018, he spoke at the Rosenbach about his book, The Dark Interval, Rilke's Letters on Loss, Grief, and Transformation, in which you were the translator and editor of those letters. That was, that was fabulous. Uh, welcome to the virtual Rosenbach tonight. The, uh, and the, um, uh, the books, that I, was, I was looking earlier, I mean, the, your, 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 new, your new book, or, or I don't even know if so, there, you may have had, you've had books even since this, perhaps, because you have so many that come out. Um, but the uh, My Own Dear Darling Boy book, you've, you've, you've published this with Warbler Press, and I was looking at their offerings, and there are, you have lots of books through Warbler that you're doing afterwards, intros, editing, talk about that a little bit. So I am really, um, I'm really happy to be invited to talk about Wild today. So I edited this small book, My Own Dear Darling Boy. This is just some letters that Rosenbach, and I'll talk about that, had first acquired and published from Oscar Wilde to Lord Alfred Douglas. And then the other books you're referring to, so with Warbler Press, I'm really um, happy and excited that I get to publish introductions to some of the great classics. And my ambition is really to get these books into the hands of high school students, college students, and anybody who wants to read for, for a 21st century audience. So I've done a lot of books from Frankenstein to Jane Eyre, to The Scarlet Letter, to The Prophet, to The Great Gatsby, to Mrs. Dalloway. I'm wrestling right now with how and whether to read Ernest Hemingway's The Sun Also Rises in the 21st century. I give my, the audience one little piece of information Hemingway uses the n-word 16 times in one page and probably 90 percent of the criticism on the sun also rises manages to not notice that fact. I actually think it's a great opportunity to say what we can see today that we maybe were not willing to see for such a long time so that's kind of my ambition how to see these works and keep them alive for a new generation of people who have maybe some shifted interests. Good. I love that. And I love that you're, you're, you're willing to, to, to talk about the things that we ought oh, to yeah. be talking about. Right. Yes. I actually think like to not talk about that is going to end these books in some purgatory where they're going to be like not discussed or people are going to be so uncomfortable or skittish about them. And that's, that's not, a, that's not a good thing for any book, I think. Well, tonight we have Oscar Wilde. Let me tell everybody our format for the evening. If you have a question, for Ulrich and you're watching the program on Zoom, you can put it in the chat or you can put it in the Q&A. There's already someone with a question in the Q&A. We'll get to those later. Um, Ulrich will speak about, about, about this book, about this endeavor, about these letters, and um, I'll disappear. And then I'll come back on towards the end and we'll field some questions. Are you all ready? And Ed, if you can give me, I think, uh, I have share screening privileges. Okay, awesome, good. Yeah, okay, so yeah, you can share screen, yeah. Excellent, all righty, take it away, sir. Very good. Okay, so uh, let me see. Make this here. Here we are. Dear darling boy, you can all see the screen, right? Yes. Yep. Okay. So what I want to talk about today is this um, edition of 
uh, Oscar Wilde's letters, the surviving letters to Lord Alfred Douglas, the young man with whom he fell in love when Lord Alfred Douglas was 21, Oscar was about 16, 17 years older. Uh, he was a student at Oxford, uh, Lord Alfred Douglas named Bosey and Wilde was an accomplished uh, writer. They fell in love and then um, had this kind of ongoing relationship. Wilde is married, as some people in the audience who are much far greater Wilde experts, I'm really curious to hear your take on some of this. And what I want you to think about with me, why I became really interested in this um, moment in literary history where literature, letter writing, biography, and the law intersect in a way to generate something that produces something new. And I'll just walk you through a few quotes here to get you oriented what my real concern or question was with these letters. And I'll start you out with two quotes from Wilde, which are in his kind of sublime fashion, uh, deeply ironic without ever veering into kind of sarcasm or cynicism. So he says, most people are other people, which is a quote that Ardeth Ashley, who's publishing a book called The Return of Oscar Wilde, used as the epigram to her novel. Their thoughts are someone else's opinions, their lives a mimicry, their passions a quotation. And I want, us, I want you to think about that for a moment, that we actually take so much in from other people. And Wilde is the kind of go-to author for a witty quote. So Wilde would laugh at the fact that we're using Wilde quotes to illustrate our own lives. He would say that's exactly the wrong way to do it. You have to come up with your own language. And what I want to talk about right now, I'll show you two more quotes of what power a word can have. And there's a word that will change Oscar Wilde's life, destroy his life, because it'll bring him to trial. And we'll look at that for a moment. So one's real life is so often a life that one does not lead. Another one of those great Wilde quotes that you think, oh, I'm going to put that on my screensaver on my phone and be inspired by it. And then Wilde tells you also, little sincerity is a dangerous thing and a great deal of sincerity is absolutely fatal. So everything I'm going to see, say today, I'm going to say with that in mind that I'm a little sincere, which is already taking a risk, but I'm not really all that sincere. Um, and what we're trying to figure out in this collection that I edited, and thank you, Ed, for inviting me to do this, my own dear darling boy, I want to tell you two little stories, really, the story of this collection and what happens between Oscar and Lord Alfred Douglas and this colorized photograph here on the cover, a very famous photograph um, that's made literary history, been an inspiration for gay and LGBT history, has also been one of the great scandals of Victorian England. And this relationship is something I want to talk about. And then I want to talk about um, Rosenbach, who we're kind of honoring today at, at the Rosenbach, who bought these letters at auction in, 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 in New York and then sold them to Clark, who founded the Clark Library at today's UCLA campus in California, and then they published them right away. So there's two stories. One is between Wilde and Douglas, and the other one is why did Rosenbach get so invested in buy them and then publish them right away in America? The simple answer is because Rosenbach wanted to make them available to the public and break British copyright so other people could take, could, ref, could refer to them. And then Rosenbach says something really important, I think, that it has been stated by nearly all of his biographers and by Wilde himself in prison that Lord Alfred Douglas was the spirit tempting him to ill. This, however, was far from the truth. He writes to his own darling boy from Dieppe, in France, that his only hope of doing beautiful work in art is being with you. Do remake my ruined life for me. So what Rosenbach wants to do is he says, all biographers, literally all biographers, ultimately put Wilde on trial, directly or indirectly, and say, why in the world did he fall for this manipulative, entitled, privileged, golden boy who actually ultimately ruined his life? So they're kind of saying Lord Douglas was the one who corrupted or tempted or ruined and brought Oscar Wilde to his downfall. And they keep on putting him on trial for that. What the letters do, and I'll read you one of the letters to get us started out on the tone and the, let's say the mood of what Wilde is doing here. What I wanna think about is that even today in the most sympathetic and extensively researched books. So one of these books is right here, it's Merlin Holland, so uh, Wilde's grandson, The Real Trial of Oscar Wilde by Merlin Holland, which he met in communication, and he's an amazingly generous 
person is the grandson and he's published the entire trial transcripts of the Oscar Wilde proceedings. And then there's other biographies, Matthew Sturgis, the Oscar biography recently that got a very complicated review in the New York Times by David Hare, the playwright, and really puts Oscar on trial, ultimately finds Bosey a despicable character, goes on the defensive for Constance, the wife, and basically ends up giving you a portrait of somebody who was corrupted by a young man, made a big mistake, and should have done better. Ask uh, Merlin Holland, which is useful, also asks a question, and he says, why on earth did you do it? He wants to ask his grandfather, why on earth did you do it and go into this situation with this young man and then ultimately go to trial? But to switch registers and to give you a sense of what we are actually asked to look at, I'll read you one of the letters that is in this small collection that I edited. And this is Oscar writing to Bozy. He says, my own boy, you sign it is quite lovely and it is a marvel that those red rose leaf lips of yours should have been made no less for music and song than for madness of kissing. Your slim gilt soul walks between passion and poetry. I know Hyacinthus, whom Apollo loved so madly, was you in Greek days. Why are you alone in town? And when do you go to Salisbury? Do go there and cool your hands in the great twilight of Gothic things and come here whenever you like. It is a lovely place. It only lacks you. But go to Salisbury first. And you were always with undying love, yours, Asuka. So this letter was published by Rosenbach in the early 1920s after he had purchased the manuscript, the letters who were on sale for various reasons. And this letter is actually an interesting letter because it had been used once before to blackmail Bosey and then Wilde. And Wilde had to pay a young man, a blackmailer, who had stolen the jacket. And this letter was in the coat pocket of this jacket. So this letter has another history of the first time that Oscar Wilde felt in the slang of that time rented when he was blackmailed by a young guy who said, I have something in my possession that could damage you professionally. So he bought the letters back. This letter wasn't among those letters. He thought this is a letter that the blackmailer had. And Oscar Wilde laughed it off. This experience is important because the first time when, not the first time when Oscar was starting to get into trouble for his relationships with young men and someone tried to blackmail him, he said, really, you're gonna blackmail me and you want 30, 30 pounds for my letters? My letters are worth infinitely more and I'll pay you that money. Typical kind of uh, Wildean irony. The second letter I'll read to you is, dearest of all boys, your letter was delightful, red and yellow wine to me, but I am sad and out of sorts, Bozy. You must not make scenes with me. They kill me. They wreck the loveliness of life. I cannot see you so Greek and gracious, distorted by passion. I cannot listen to your curved lips saying hideous things to me. Don't do it. You break my heart. I'd sooner be rented all day and have you bitter, unjust, and horrid, horrid. I must see you soon. You are the divine thing I want, the thing of grace and genius but I don't know how to do it. Shall I come to Salisbury? There are many difficulties. My bill here is 49 pounds for a week. I've also got a new sitting room over the Thames, but you, why are you not here, my dear, my wonderful boy? I fear I must leave. No money, no credit, and a heart of lead. Ever your own, Oscar. So I just want you to stay with this letter for a moment and say, it's a heartbreaking letter. It's a gorgeous letter about somebody not being there. It's one of the great testimonies, I think, to the power of a great writer who actually lets his guard down in all of his other works. Oscar Wilde is very meticulous about his technique in the plays, which are these incredible demonstrations of beautiful economy of language and pacing and timing and character. In the novel, the picture of Dorian Gray, where he balances these kind of philosophical reflections on what is the role of art with the drive of his characters toward their own doom and destruction. But here, he just says, I cannot listen to your curved lips saying hideous things to me. Don't do it. You break my heart. And what I want you to think about is when we read this letter today, 1893, it is mostly read as another piece of evidence in the case of Oscar Wilde, who is either a great martyr, a gay icon, a liberator for the LGBT movement, or a martyr for the cause of free speech and the power of literature, because what's on trial when Oscar Wilde goes to trial is both 
his love for young boys, younger boys, teenagers and 20 year olds, I guess. And the fact that he wrote books that would corrupt the young. It's very important that in the first trial, uh, in Oscar Wilde's trial, what comes up more and more is not actually the boys who will rent him or blackmail him and ultimately become witnesses for the prosecution against him in later trials. But in the first trial, what comes up is really his writings mostly. So what's on trial of literature is the imagination, is homosexuality defined by Victorian standards. And then something else I think that becomes very complicated and it'll come up in the way the biographers have to take sides. I think what comes up is in this um, idea is who's at fault here? Is it the young man who's corrupted Oscar Wilde who's older and better? Or is it Oscar Wilde who's given into temptation? Or is it Oscar Wilde the manipulative great provocateur who wants to challenge Victorian society? And in some ways I think why the biographers and why people are still so troubled and they kind of want to say to Oscar Wilde through history and through time and through their pages, when Merlin Holland, the grandson asks, why on earth did you do it to his grandfather? He wants to stop him essentially from doing what he's doing. As if Wilde could have been saved from Bosey from somebody else. And I think what's behind that is a profound set unsettling and insecurity, a kind of panic at the fact that we don't quite know how to make sense of the fact that two men could be in a relationship and we can't quite decide who's dominant and who's dictating the terms and who is passive and supposedly accepting the terms. And there's some kind of weird psychic disturbance about homosexuality itself and not about the fact that this is gay, but the fact that we can't decide who's in charge. And that I think is actually behind this kind of anxiety and even people today who are speaking in very liberated terms in terms of like, we have gone so far, we have, uh, LGBT rights, et cetera, they're still troubled by this fact. They say, well, this is great. Oscar Wilde paved the way for gay liberation and for writers, you know, from Proust to Forster to Genet, all these people who made Wilde into a model and were very obsessed or Gide obsessed with him, really became interested in him and also writing in fear for a long time because of what happened to him. It's not really that he was gay that is the thing that's upsetting or confusing to biographers. They just don't know who is in charge in this relationship. So let me go on. So this is the next step right here. And I'm walking through this pretty quickly and I hope people can follow and I apologize, but I'm happy to expand and hear also from people in the audience who you know, know far more than I do about this. So this is the calling card that the father of Lord Alfred Douglas, the Marquess of Queensberry, left for Oscar Wilde at his club. And Oscar Wilde came a week later or so, two weeks later on 18 February, 1895, a fateful day that he later said, I wish I'd been in Paris that day and left London and never gotten this card and they would have been forgotten. It says to Oscar Wilde, posing as sodomite. So this is supposed to be sodomite. He misspelled that word, posing as sodomite. And I want us to stay with that for a moment as well. When I said, when I read the sentence right before, when Oscar Wilde says to Bosey, you break my heart. That is not just a constitutive statement that is describing something. But it's a performative statement. He's saying, by me writing this, it is breaking my heart, actually. I'm putting something in action. Something is happening when I say these words to myself. You break my heart. It's not just a fact that happened. It is happening to me right now. When the Marquess of Queensberry leaves this card and puts this word out, which is just a slur. In our language today, calling somebody, you know, a slur. The N word, the F word, the K word, all the slurs that I'm not gonna repeat because they actually have a power beyond the control of my speech. And that's what I want you to think about. When the Marquess of Queens Bay leaves this card, this word, sodomite, is an insult that alters and affects and breaks Oscar Wilde's world. And the biographers keep on saying, oh, you should have ripped it up afterwards. Andre Gide, all these people say, you should have just thrown it in the fire or move on. George Bernard Shaw says, why did you go for this? Why did you let yourself be triggered by this kind of word? So I'll give you two ways of thinking about this. Here's Jean Genet. Oh, I'm sorry about that. This is a spelling mistake. Oops. Uh, a vertiginous word arisen from the bottom of the world destroys the beautiful order. This is Jean Genet in La Galère, a poem uh, that Jean Paul Sartre cites in his book on Saint Genet. So Saint Genet lives in the 1950s, French writer who was also is um, punished by law for obscenity for some of his writings as a homosexual writer. 
And he writes, a vertiginous word arisen from the bottom of the world destroys the beautiful order. That word that uh, the Marquis of Queensbury uses, Samdamite, that is a word, a word that destroys the beautiful order of Oscar Wilde's life. And it is a word that has a far greater impact than any word one could think could have. This is George Bernard Shaw in a letter to Wilde's biographer, who no one really likes, Frank Harris, who wrote one of the first biographies. He was one of the ex-lovers, very defensive. And he says, and, Oscar, and George Bernard Shaw writes a really positive assessment of Wilde, all of his memories. They're both from Ireland, of course. They share a lot of bio biographical details. And he says, in the middle of this letter, I have all the normal violent repugnance to homosexuality if it is really normal, which nowadays one is sometimes provoked to doubt, 1915. And I just want you to give you a sense of what world we're living in, that these are Oscar Wilde's friends. This is someone who's defending him, who says, I have the normal repugnance to homosexuality. So if we want to put the Marquess of Queensbury in a side that like he was a vile character, a horrible person who tried to destroy Wilde's reputation and hurt him, this is just part of everyday, everyday kind of discourse to speak in this way. And then I'll, I'll stop right here for a moment. So we have the letters that Oscar Wilde writes to Bozy. They're love letters. He is just over the moon, really happy with this guy. He says, why aren't you here? It's perfect, wonderful day, except you, I miss you. If you were here, life would be wonderful. He keeps on writing letters after letters of this. And then he goes to trial and there's a vast betrayal. Oscar Wilde, the superstar, of, state, of the stage at that time. Ultimately, after he's sentenced, after three trials, and I'm abbreviating a lot here, he will be sentenced to hard labor for gross indecency for two years, 1895, he goes to prison. His names are stripped from the marquees of most theaters. His books are not sold anymore under his name. And he's really vilified and disgraced by society. And what is needed to actually turn this moment into not a kind of story of a martyr. And there's been a question in the biographies whether like Sturgis, Matthew Sturgis says, Oscar Wilde suffered from inertia and defiance by not fleeing the country and leaving for the continent. Merlin Holland says he was partly arrogant. He was partly feeling he was the tragic hero and martyr and partly he wanted to defend his own literature. Um, and that's why he actually didn't just run away and say like, I'm gonna live in Paris and live in France and, and not deal with these Victorian bigots who are gonna put, put me into prison. So he stayed there and suffered this fate, which is really something that crushed him ultimately he dies in 1900, um, shortly after he's released from prison, three years after. He never sees his children again. He has to leave England right away when he comes out of prison. So he has a life that is considered kind of ruined. Um, and then I want to think about what happens to these letters. So Rosenbach, you know, in whose honor I'm here today, so, so ASW Rosenbach, who is the greatest book dealer in America, probably in the 20th century, the Napoleon of the auction room, bought these letters and published them right away. And there's another sense of betrayal in that. And I wanted to just listen to a moment here. So this is Rosenbach right here in an essay called Letters That We Ought to Burn, where he says, I really had trepidation to publish love letters originally. Like, who does that? They're intimate, they're personal, they're private, they're affairs of the heart. They shouldn't be for the prying eyes of the public. So he says, it was naturally in my youth that I first became interested in love letters. Yet 30 years ago, I had an altogether different view from that which I have today. I felt a certain shyness, suffered twinges of conscience, reading letters that were only intended for the eyes of one person. To me, it was on a par with peeking through a keyhole. The lines that Shelley wrote to Mary Godwin were Keats telling the agony of his love to beautiful and elegant, graceful, silly, fashionable and strange Fanny Braun seemed to me sacred. I understood Oscar Wilde's despair, which caused him to write his exquisite sonnet on the sale of au an auction of Keats' love letters to Fanny Braun. Wilde was present that March 2nd, 1885, little dreaming that the time would come when his own letters even the original manuscript of the poem that he penned that very day would appear on the auction block. Wild sonnet runs as follows. On the sale by auction of Keats love letters. These are the letters which Endymion wrote to one he loved in secret and apart. 
And now the brawlers of the auction mart bargain and bid for each poor blotted note. I, for each separate pulse of passion, quote, the latest price. I think they love not art, who break the crystal of a poet's heart that small and sickly eyes may glare or gloat. Is it not said that many years ago in a far Eastern town, some soldiers ran with torches through the midnight and began to wrangle for mean raiments and to throw dice for the garments of a wretched man, not knowing the God's wonder or his woe. So while it's appalled that someone is selling love letters, and in this sentence right here, when Rosenbach says, Wilde was little dreaming at the time would come when his own letters would appear on the auction block, Rosenbach doesn't tell you in this essay that he is the one who bought them. So he bid the money, he purchased them, he even bought that sonnet, which is now in the Rosenbach collection in Philadelphia. So you can go and see it um, because it's now open by appointment, right? <laughs> um, and then so this is what Wilde, so what Rosenbach is doing. So he buys these letters turns around and publishes them, having overcome his youthful trepidation. And then he explains what is happening in these letters. And this is very important, I think, what he says about these letters. And it's a very unusual moment of a bookseller, ultimately, who actually, I think, transcends the concerns of many wild biographers. And he says, nowhere was Wilde so glorious, so naive, and so impulsive as in his letters. In his books, we see the calm, thoughtful, retrospective artist, who, although playful, even joyous at times, was always reserved classic in his manner, in fact, the lord of language. It was in the comedy of manners that Wilde excelled. It was the medium in which he could best display sparkling, although never caustic wit, the exuberance of his humor, the brilliance of his epigraphs, the ever compelling flow of his spirits. Quite unconsciously, however, Oscar Wilde has given us a piece of his own sorrows, of his wrecked life that is almost without a parallel in the literary history. It is in his letters to Lord Alfred Douglas, now printed for the first time, that his nakedness is exhibited to use frankly, almost indecently, and there's nothing in them that can cover or shield him. It is not for this reason that the letters are revealed to the world. They are now issued in order to give a truer impression of the man and his life than we formerly possessed. For in the profundus, Oscar Wilde deliberately set to work to create a wrong impression. In the silence of reading Gaul, he used his pen with merciless effect. He wrote cruelly, critically, with his tongue in cheek. It is on account of this that the Profundus is not a truthful human document. It is full of lies, deceit, honeyed phrases, and mock religion. In the letters to Alfred Douglas, dashed off quickly, without a moment's thought, they would be seen by other eyes. There's nothing that is not self-revealing. So Rosenbach is the man who gets these letters into print for the first time. And he says, his nakedness is exhibited to us frankly and almost indecently, and there's nothing in them that can cover or shield him. But Rosenbach does this precisely to allow Wilde to look as who he is to us today and not to put him on trial again, not to judge him and not to say, he is Wilde who makes this grave mistake of falling in love with a young man who is going to corrupt him and actually sacrifice his career, his fame, his life to go to prison for two years and die too early. And so here's another letter that um, uh, for Rosenbach is so important because Rosenbach in some ways says these letters transcend their historical moment and say something to us today. This is 1922 when Rosenbach writes 1923 and we are exactly 100 years later. So Wilde writes to Bozy. As for you, you have given me the beauty of life in the past, in the future, if there is any future. That is why I shall be eternally grateful to you for having always inspired me with adoration and love. Those days of pleasure were our dawn. Now in anguish and pain and grief and humiliation, I feel that my love for you, your love for me, are the two signs of my life, the divine sentiments which make all bitterness bearable. Never has anyone in my life been dearer than you. Never has any love been greater, more sacred, more beautiful. Dear boy, among pleasures or in prison, you and the thought of you were everything to me. Oh, keep me always in your heart. You are never absent from mine. I think of you much more than of myself. And if sometimes the thought of horrible and infamous suffering comes to torture me, the simple thought of you is enough to strengthen me and heal my wounds. Let destiny, nemesis, or the unjust gods alone receive the blame for everything that has happened. 
So what Wild wants to do in this letter, I think, is to put their love in a place that cannot be touched by all the other things that will happen to them. So when he says, no, never has anyone in my life been dearer than you. Never has any love been greater, more sacred, more beautiful. On the one hand, you can think it's a nice letter to get. Who wouldn't want to get a letter like this? Their love is already over at this point in a way, but never has any love been greater, more sacred, more beautiful. And I think Wilde literally means never has any love among human beings in the history of humanity ever been greater, more sacred, or more beautiful. And of course, this is not true, except it is true as soon as Bozy believes it. And that I think is exactly where the letters tilt into something like poetry, is when someone says something to the other person and wants to make them feel truly seen and truly loved. And the other person actually receives that and feels truly seen and truly addressed and truly loved, then this is true. And there's a truth established between those two people that cannot be touched by anybody else, by nemesis, unjust God's destiny, the justices, the barristers, the court, the crown, all the people who will put uh, Wild in prison and all the people who actually abandon him right after all this happens. So he says, our love is true. It's already passed at this time. This is why I shall be eternally grateful to you for having inspired me with adoration and love. It's not even it's sort of actual love, but it is true because Wilde can name it in this way and Bozy can receive this letter. So I think what Rosenbach wanted us to have is these kind of letters as evidence that some, a truth between two human beings can be established when one person says something that they want the other person truly to believe in. So here's... Um, a comment which I find I found really strange. So when I discovered this little the, the edition, the, the the manuscript of this little book here from the 1920s, you know, I read it. I was honestly I was kind of excited the way one is in archives. Um, there's about 20 some copies of this in American archives in rare book reading rooms um, at Columbia University's one in New York City at the Clark in uh, Los Angeles at the Rosenbach, of course, in Philadelphia. And when I saw these letters, I was excited to read them. And then I stumbled across this note, which surprised me. It says, these letters from Oscar Wilde to Bozzi speak eloquently. They sum up the situation better than any biographer, however just and impartial he may be. It has not been our purpose to defend Douglas in any way. It is, however, necessary for us to dispel a mendacious impression, a false atmosphere, that Wilde created many years ago and which if not corrected would have crept into the chronicle of our literary history. This mendacious impression, this false atmosphere which Wilde created is that he was corrupted by Bozy, that ultimately Bozy betrayed him and betrayed him again. And if it hadn't been for Bozy egging him on to sue the father and go to trial and push him and make him do things he didn't wanna do, his life would have not been derailed in this way. And Rosenbach says, this is a lie which is a mendacious impression, a false atmosphere, which is a pretty strong charge to level at a writer who was one of the greatest writers in the English language. And he says, the letters actually tell a different story. So Rosenbach thought these few letters, this little tiny book tells a different story from the story that Wilde propagated. And that still runs its course through a lot of Wilde literature because people cannot stop from making a judgment and saying, if only he hadn't done this, if only he hadn't let Bozy take the lead and make him go to trial against Bozy's father, who Bozy hated. And then because uh, Wilde brought the first charge of libel against uh, uh, the Marquess of Queensbury and Wilde instigated basically his own downfall by going to trial. And then that has been reworked and saying, oh, no, no, Wilde sacrificed himself and became the martyr for LGBT rights. He actually did the right thing because now we can be inspired by his model. He actually went basically in front of the world and testified to his love, the love that dare not speak his name in Douglas's word and therefore became a hero for us. But even that is a misinterpretation according to Rosenbach. It puts it into the service of something else. And Rosenbach wants to say, here nothing is in the service of anything but this love between these two people. And then he says, Rosenbach, there's included in Mr. Clark's collection of Wilde's letters to Douglas, a single letter written by Lord Alfred Douglas to Oscar Wilde. This is given without comment at the end of the volume. And I'll do something here. I hope you can do this. So, so you can see this is the um, facsimile and you can't see it at all, <laughs> which is part of the point. This is a facsimile and the Clark edition 
which was Rosenbach and the Clock Edition in the 1920s, published this effect similarly of Douglas's letter to Wilde, and all of Wilde's letters to Bosey are transcribed. So it's almost unreadable. So when I came across this manuscript, I thought, wait, why is, there, why is this letter to Bosey here? And it's as if Rosenbach wanted to say something without saying it. He said, this is given without comment at the end of the volume. He has the most beautiful things to say about Wilde's letters to Bosey. He says, these are genuine expressions of a poet who's naked before us and reveals himself unselfconsciously, now having gotten rid of Rosenbach's kind of hesitation to publish these kinds of intimate letters. He said, this is a testimony to someone's truth that we wouldn't get from his art from the legal trial, from the biographies that we have here. And then he gives you the letter from Bosey and just includes the facsimile that you have to decipher it. So this is the letter from Bosey. My darling Oscar, have just arrived here. It seems too dreadful to be here without you, but I hope you will join me here next week. Dieppe was too awful for anything. It is the most depressing place in the world. Even Petit Chabot was not to be had. And as the casino was closed, these are hotels. They are very nice here and I can stay as long as I like without paying my bill, which is a good thing as I'm quite penniless. The proprietor is very nice and most sympathetic. He asked after you at once and expressed his great indignation at the treatment you had received. I shall have to send this by a cab to the Gare du Nord to catch the post as I want you to get it first post tomorrow. I'm going to see if I can find Robert Sherrard tomorrow if he's in Paris. Charlie is with me and sends you his best love. I had a long letter from can't decipher this this morning about you. Do keep up your spirits, my dear darling. I continue to think of you day and night, and I send you all my love. I'm always to your own loving and devoted boy, Bosey. So this letter is only in manuscript for this. That's why it's not completely transcribed. And I'll end with this question because I think they're comments, and I'd love to hear what people have to say or add. Um, um, far from this is Lord Alfred Douglas. He said in 1915, so he survives Wilde, of course, he says, far from leading me as, his leading me astray, it was I that unwittingly pushed him over the precipice. So here you have the kind of question of who is responsible for whose downfall um, and who is to be blamed for what happened to Wilde. And Rosenbach, I think, wanted to give us these letters to say, in this kind of exchange where someone professes his true genuine love that you are the fulfillment of my world, you are the person I really want here to be complete, that in this kind of arrangement, this kind of duality that's not really a duality, that you cannot decide who's responsible for what. And I think Rosenbach just wanted to open that space up. Um, I think I'll stop sharing my screen. I apologize if it's the screen. I just saw a chat comment, but I didn't see it while I was doing it. So um, some questions that came up, uh, the published, Douglas destroyed most of the letters to Oscar Wilde. So they, are, they were supposed to be about 150 letters that, Oscar, that Douglas had, and he destroyed most of them. So we have very, very few extant letters. Um, Merlin Holland has published uh, the ones that exist. So I included two that, weren't in this collection right here with the permission of Merlin Holland. Um, so we have only this kind of remnant of a, one of the great love stories of history uh, available to us today. Um, why wasn't Douglas prosecuted for indecency? Well, Douglas left England, first of all. Uh, secondly, he was an aristocrat and his father, presumably, we don't really know this, his father probably exerted some pressure on the prime minister who, this is the, the life of Oscar Wilde's time. The prime minister of England at that time, Roseberry, was rumored to have had a gay relationship with, with the Marquis of Queensberry's other son, Lord Alfred Posey's brother. So in order not to reveal that, supposedly there was political pressure, which would have basically spared Lord Alfred Douglas. There's another question hidden in this one. Why wasn't Douglas prosecuted for indecency, for gross indecency, the way Oscar Wilde was? Douglas presumably wanted to take the stand and defend Wilde and was never put on the stand, on the witness stand. And they said he would have incriminated himself. So actually people tried to protect him and Oscar Wilde always said, I never wanted Bosey. I never wanted Bosey to take the fall for this. I never wanted him to actually risk his reputation, standing, career. I was ready to do this. And there's a question that I think 
um, behind that, that I actually, what I'm trying to say is a question I don't really want to answer. And the question is when people have called the trial a total folly and said, Oscar Wilde goes into it, makes a decision to start defending his life, his reputation, himself, his love. And a lot of people still say today, it's a total folly, he shouldn't have done this. As I said, the flip side of that, uh, everybody from André G to, you know, to today's kind of, you know, the Oscar Wilde book bookshops that still exist in the world. New York City had an Oscar Wilde bookshop for many years. It's a kind of idea that he did something very heroic. He sacrificed himself for a greater cause. I think what Rosenbach wants to hint at is that he actually sacrificed himself not for a greater cause, but that there was something true for him in his relationships with some of these men and also with Bozy. And that this truth, to compromise this truth for the sake of a kind of legal evasion of the truth would have been too high a cost. But that's a, that's a way to, um, okay, Joseph Mendes has a lot of questions. What was Bozy also the person who hired Rent Voice? You know, um, possibly. Yes, Matthew Sturges in his recent biography, I'm not such a great fan of this biography. I think it's a really judgmental biography without offering a lot of great insight into the literary works. And he details every payment, every person who was brought to a hotel room and given champagne and afterwards presumably slept with Wilde. And Matthew Sturges, I mean, who either has sources I'm not aware of or has a very vivid imagination, like literally knows at what time of the night Oscar Wilde put his hand into the pants of another man. So thinking, wow, I haven't seen it in other biographies. So I kind of think these questions are, yes, Bozy was responsible in a certain way, but is it on us? And this is what the Rosenbach story, I think, makes so interesting. Rosenbach stopped short of those questions. He basically gave us this book gave us these letters and said, I will leave the letter from Bozy to Wilde with no comment. I will give you the letters from Wilde to Bozy to correct an impression that Wilde created that he had been corrupted. And then I will leave it to posterity to judge for ourselves. Behind that is Rosenbach's own kind of story, which is very interesting. And, um, you know, Rosenbach himself and, you know, the, maybe Ed can help us out here, but of course, Rosenbach himself published um, a very funny sort of set of short stories in the like eight, 1916 or something like that. And one of those stories ends the crazy book collector who's obsessed with buying books and he uses his wife's money to buy more and more books. And then they get into a fight at the end and the wife is very frustrated because he's really unavailable and keeps on just thinking about his books. And he says, I have an unspeakable vice. And that is those precious books and marriage just the last thing anyways. And then this is the end of their marriage. And you kind of think, so this is Rosenbach who four years later buys Wilde's letters, knows about them, publishes them, knows exactly the quote of the love that dare not speak his name. And he has a character who sub has his sublimated love of precious books as a way to escape a heterosexual marriage. So I always thought like Rosenbach puts a few clues in for us to read today. <laughs> and, and I haven't been able to figure out much else about, about that part of Rosenbach. The other great detail I know, when the Rosenbach lived in Philadelphia, something that's always totally intrigued me. They kept live terrapin in their, ba in their, in their basement of their townhouse for yeah. supper or something every day, right? So they had turtles there in a tank and, and then maybe ordered them up. <laughs> but Rosenbach was definitely a colorful character who had an amazing capacity to look at literature and writers and push his own temptation to judge out of the way and give people space and give wild that space to say this is these are these letters and we are not in a position to really adjudicate here who is guilty of what who's manipulating whom he says they are testaments of great beauty yeah and so i think there's rosenberg is really an, an enormously important person in the wild reception because he tries to correct something from a space that the wild critics ultimately have a really hard time making sense of. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. And, and, and kind of hints at what, what you had written in your preface uh, to the book, which was, yeah, like Wild has a point that he's trying to make in court, not necessarily to defend himself as a homosexual, but, but that, as you put it, that the authentic expression of one's love is an irreducibly personal and creative act. 
and and I like how you I, I like how that's phrased, and and I almost feel that that you're making the case too that Dr. Rosenbach seems to recognize that too, and that that these letters are these great creative, you know, uh, outpourings of someone's you know emotions, and that's why they're valuable, and we should um, uh, read them still, and they should be published. And I, you know, that's actually, you know, what you just wrote, read back to me. And of course, I can't remember writing this because of <laughs> yeah. the pandemic and who knows, you know, like you try, you try, like I was so in the world, we were talking about this earlier. I was so in the world of Wild and the letters that I thought they are an expression of one's authentic self. But I, I think what I wanted to get at is, it's not authentic in the sense we think this is Wilde himself. It is only him in an authentic way in relation to Bozy. This relationship for Wilde, that was a real relationship. There are other parts of Wilde where he's himself and expresses himself. And, but this is not about self-expression as a kind of identity. And like, I can phrase this in another way. So I looked at, there's a, a very remarkable book by the uh, French sociologist and philosopher Didier Eribon, and he has a kind of, he discusses wild and this kind of insult, the slur, that's when he says posing a sodomite. He said, what happens when someone is insulted like this? He said, people are ripped out of their world and put in their place. And they identified as this with a kind of slur and an insult. And then Eribon says something really interesting. He says, the gay rights movement appropriates wild, makes him into their hero. That's really important and wonderful. He says, that's really all important. Legal victories are crucially important. People need to get their rights recognition, et cetera. And then something else has to remain totally open, which is how you then make this part of yourself that is supposed to be in opposition to culture into a generative productive thing for all parts of your life. That is not just you become a gay person and therefore you can love people of the same sex and then you're locked into this. He said, yeah, you generate new things. So what I meant by authentic, Wild opens up something for us to be authentic that's not reducible to saying, oh, he's a gay writer who mm -hmm. goes to trial and is outed, yeah. which, which forecloses the identity again, as it were. Then it's like, okay, gay writer, great. And like, that's not what's at stake for Wild. For Wild, I think what's at stake is I can find this expression in myself in relation to others, and it'll be again, yet again, different in relation to yet other people. Lewis has, a, has an interesting question here in, uh, uh, in De Profundis, uh, Wild scolds Lord Alfred for publishing uh, Wild's letters in a French magazine while Wild was in prison in Pentonville. Um, and then he says, do you agree with Dr. Rosenbach that De Profundis was the best a disingenuous attempt to change the narrative of the catastrophic love story? And if so, how do you reconcile Wild's piercing assessment of Lord Alfred's art and sensibilities in the letter? You know, it's a great question. Like, is like Rosenbach basically says, yeah, it's mendacious. It's fabricating a story. It's mm -hmm. exculpating. And he says, Wilde had way too much time. Two years is a very long time to, in prison. He's, he had way too much time to construct the story and turn himself into a little bit of the, the person who had been manipulated by Bozy. What Wilde wants, uh, what Rosenbach wants to say, this is a lie. What happened to Wilde is he fell in love. And you could think about it in a different way. Of course, Wilde was totally manipulated precisely because he fell in love. He was manipulated by this experience of love. He wasn't himself. He did things he wouldn't have done before. And Rosenbach wants to say, and then he tried to blame Bozy for all this. He said, Bozy wasn't to blame for anything. This love happened between them. You can't say, you made me fall in love with you. That's mm -hmm. not what happened. And there's the, the beginning of the affair. Supposedly, Bozy said, Wild quote, laid siege, unquote, to me for six months. Couldn't stop stalking him. <laughs> and Oscar Wilde said, what? We didn't see each other for 18 months. I hardly knew who he was. So there's like the beginning isn't quite the same. And this, this discussion of what's authentic or what's not, like I'm very interested in letters and I've edited Rilke's letters and other letters. There is something of the letter that's, is in a complicated relation to, an, to a poet or a writer's work because they're using these letters often to try out ideas to like, a, it's like, it's like in the moment they're dashing off something and they're not meant to be read by others. So there's an authentic one. So I do think they're more authentic and deep profundus, they're really, mm -hmm. 
I like Rosenbach because he is a kind of intrepid critic in, in addition to being an amazing book dealer, collector, archivist, all this, but he says, here, Wilde is lying. We don't have that many critics today who would make those kind of statements, who would say, well, yeah. well it's a you know, great icon. You can't really tell him he's lying. And Rosenbach said, no, he's lying here. This is wrong. <laughs> and I, I want to remind everybody that, that you can, uh, we, 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 we do have, you know, Lots of wild holdings at the at the Rosenbach letters and manuscripts uh, and, and first editions. We have a we have the uh, fine uh, fair copy manuscript Wild's fair copy manuscript of Salome on display right now that you could see at the Rosenbach in the program gallery if you stop by. Well, we have this lovely letter too in. Um, it's tipped in to a first edition of Ballad of Reading Jail. And this is not a well-known letter. And I was just looking at a recent uh, uh, collection of Wilde's letters and it's not in there. And I, and I wonder if, because it's tipped into this book, has, this letter has escaped, but it's, it's not that. And it's a letter to Robert Ross, very short letter, 1898 after his prison term. And it's just, and it's, it's a heartbreaking too. It's, it's just, dearest Bobby, the idea for the ballad, Ballad of Reading Jail, came to me while I was in the dock waiting for my sentence to be pronounced. Bosey mustn't say he originated it. So he's apparently answering some kind of question from, from, from Ross. And then, and then it ends, I am very miserable ever Oscar. And it is just so tragic to read this, you know, time afterwards that he's still wrapped up in these issues, even having to like, I have to talk about this relationship with Bosey with other people still that, that, that still is going on after, you know, even after he served the prison sentence. It is, and it's what you're saying. It's it's um, in Wilde, who's such a master of irony, lord of language, very witty. There's always a double entendre. He has these great moments of reversal. When he says, "I'm very miserable," there's no reversal. It's not really simple to say, but also or yet. And Bosey, I think, is also that other kind of symptom in his writing. There's he. He gets incredibly upset when they fight. When Bosie isn't there, he gets upset. When Bosie doesn't respond, he gets upset. When they're there, they have a great time, but then they don't have a great time. But there's never a reversal of Bosie in his life. It's not like, oh, I'm indifferent to you. You don't matter to me. You're good or you're bad, but you have this intensity in my life. Mm -hmm. And a lot of other things, you know, when we read Lady Windermere's Fan or Woman of No Importance, Important of Being Earnest, a lot of things are reversed constantly. You think it's this, then it's exactly the opposite. There's no opposite to Bosie. He's just intensity constant intensity. And that's something I think that Wilde is trying to grapple with when you think of Wilde and Picture of Dorian Gray and earlier works. He's really after in Picture of Dorian Gray, a full experience of life. When, you know, when Dorian Gray is kind of initiated by, you know, Lord Henry, like, it's the life, it's this, you want to experience all of it. This is what Wilde is actually after. What he gets is all of life. And it's not pleasant. It's not nice. It's miserable. He gets Bosey. He gets all sides of Bosey. Mm -hmm. um, there's some a question about some of the biographies, and you know, there's other people on the in the in the in, as guests and attendees who probably know much more about this. Nicholas Frankel's books, uh, The Unrepentant Years, I think, is a very beautiful book because he basically says it's a mistake to read the last four years of Wilde's life after he gets out of prison and goes to France as a failure. He's actually trying, he's doing things. And I interviewed Nicholas Frankel for a podcast on Picture of Dorian Gray because I really liked that book because the story of Wilde as washed up or tragic is, um, it's, it forecloses every letter and it forecloses all of the works because it says, well, he tried and then he failed. And the kind of tragic dimension, I think is not, he's not a tragic writer. I don't think it's tragedy is kind of the mode. Um, I also think Colm Tobin, the Irish writer, who's an amazing writer who, who edited De Profundis, I think for Penguin, he has a really long edition of it. It's, it's a very beautiful edition. It's a very brilliant introduction. And he wrote a book on Wild Shaw and, um, uh, the Irish writers, I think Yates on the fathers on kind of their role and how they're coming out of Ireland and all that. But there's something a little bit heavy and melancholic. And I think what Rosenbach tried to, what Rosenbach is remarkable, and it's not a melancholic position at all. He publishes wildly, he says, this is full of life and vitality, very complicated for us, and it needs to be out there. Um, uh, Margaret Stats has a comment here that I, that I definitely want to share because it's the wonderful Margaret Stats, who was going to be at the Rosenbach 
next week uh, for a program with Mark Samuels Lassner. This is an in-person only program about the decadent Aubrey Beardsley. Um, so you should, if, you, if you're around Philadelphia, you should sign up and come and see that. But, but, but Margaret says it is difficult to see Douglas as a sympathetic figure in light of how much he did in the years following Wilde's death to besmirch Wilde's reputation, as well as the vile role he played in the mauled Allen trial, where once again, he spoke of Wilde in the worst possible terms in court. That doesn't even get into his rampant anti-Semitisms, but you are right to focus on his younger years before these later words and actions and reactions. I think, Margaret, thank you. I think there's kind of two questions maybe in this comment, it's really important, I think. The first one is like Douglas, then spends from 1900 until whenever, like in the 30s, having this second life in a way. He both benefits, profits, and suffers from the fact that he is Wilde's lover and never escapes that. He wants to become his own man. He gets married, he writes this, he gets into these trials, as you say. He keeps on denouncing and distancing himself from Wilde. And then every once in a while, he comes back and says something really positive. This was the greatest event of my life, transformed me, et cetera, Wilde's a genius. So yes, both of those dimensions, I think. It's not just that he actually ultimately besmirches Wilde after Wilde has died. In the trial, I think you're right. He is actually, he's also defending himself. He's now in trial and he's actually just using every straw he can grab to say, I'm gonna defend myself, especially against this charge of um, corruption and homosexuality. The anti-Semitism is a totally separate question, an interesting one, because I think it's what I alluded to in the beginning, what I'm trying to work out, how do we deal with authors whose work is laced and rampant with anti-Semitism or racism or you know, any other kind of you know, bigotry. And we have lots of work like that. And mm -hmm. you sort of have traces and how do we actually account for that? Um, and I think in two ways that are not the following, the one way to do it is not sufficient to say, oh, that was the time that was kind of what most people thought, which is always incorrect. And it's not most people, it's just people who had access and power. So that's not just, oh, it's a kind of product of his time. He was anti-Semitic like so many people. And it's also not enough to say, well, we have to stop reading and cancel all these books because he's an anti-Semite. Like we have to actually figure out what is the role or function of anti-Semitism in Douglas self-image, self-creation as a writer. As a person, I don't really care as much, but as a writer, does it serve a function? So you can say anti-Semitism performs a certain function for him and that can be analyzed. And then you get somewhere, I think, where you can make sense of it without reducing its hypocrisy, its ignorance, its viciousness, but saying it actually is put there for a reason. And not just because it happens to be in the air or because, well, he's just an anti-Semite, like that doesn't, that deserves explanation. So I think it's a really important question. Um, and I'll try to come to your event on, on Beardsley. I guess that's next, that's next that's week. That's next yeah. week, yeah. Short notice for you, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's really good. Yeah, it's really we have good. a we have a couple of Beersley programs coming up. That one we have a Beersley Biblio cocktails uh, coming up in uh, April uh, as well, and um, it's been uh, it's been great having you here tonight. Talk about this. Uh, I'm 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 so happy. I I loved having you when when you did Rilke in person. I loved having you virtually. I'd love to have you back at the Rosenbach in person at some time in the future for anything. I, I really appreciate the, I, I love the Rosenbach and I think all the programs you've been doing during the pandemic, fabulous, like you doing the Jane Eyre readings, like uh, Dracula readings, like the systematic going through chapter by chapter. And um, for me, I hope, like, this is what I say, you know, when I taught, like, and when I was editing this book, my own dear darling boy, as horrible and as awful and as tragic and as lamentable, this is what happens to Oscar Wilde in a trial. If any of you could have this experience that he puts in these letters for a moment to meet someone like Bozy in your life, I think you're blessed. Yeah. Well done. Well, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. If you're looking for more virtual engagement, head on over to the Rosenbach website. Check out the other virtual programs and courses we have. Lots of cool courses coming up as well, both virtual and in person. Um, uh, we have that Beersley program next week, lots of other things. You can check it all out at our website, rosenbach.org. 
Uh, and thank you to everyone who has supported the Rosenback by donation or by joining as a member. If you haven't already, I invite you to do so. Uh, thank you all. And I'm going to leave up. I'm going to just leave this run for a little bit. We'll say good night, but I'll, I'll leave the, uh, the, the chat up for a little bit. If you want to put any of the links, if you want to copy any of the links. Um, or a good night. Thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate it. And thank you everybody for coming, including some of my friends and Ardith Ashley, whose book, The Return of Us of the Century is coming out soon, which is a reimagining of the afterlife of Oscar Wilde after 1900, which Warbler Press is proud to put out. So we'll send this to you. Um, so uh, I'm, really, I'm really happy to see so many people who have, took an interest in this tonight. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good night, readers. <laughs>